Welcome to the Blue Economy CRC seventh webinar series for this year, 2022. I'm Professor CM Wang from the University of Queensland and program leader of the Offshore Engineering and Technology at the Blue Economy CRC. Uh, firstly, on behalf of the Blue Economy CRC, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. I would also like to pay my respects to elders, past and present, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Now, for those who don't know, the Blue Economy CRC was established with a 10-year life under the Australian government CRC program in July 2019. With now uh, 45 participants, uh, this screen is still need to be updated, but we have now 45 participants from Australia and around the globe. Uh, the purpose of the Blue Economy is to perform world-class collaborative industry-focused research and training uh, that underpins the growth of the Blue Economy through increased offshore sustainable aquaculture and renewable energy production. So today's webinar is about transforming the offshore industry using digital twin uh, technology. In this webinar, we have four experts from the offshore industry who will be talking about the digital twin concept, operational mechanisms, the process of internet of things, big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and the expected growth of the digital twin in the context of the offshore industry and the applications of the digital twin technology in different industries, including the offshore uh, oil and gas, as well as renewable energy industries. Now, the, after following the uh, four presentations, there'll be a Q&A session. So please feel free to use the uh, Q&A tab to submit your questions. Um, some of the speakers will have the opportunity to answer your questions while the other speakers are talking. So uh, please feel free to use the Q&A tab. Now, allow me to introduce to you my co-facilitator today, uh, Dr. Naji Abdusami, who is a lecturer at the Australian Maritime College at the University of Tasmania. And Naji is also the Deputy Program Leader in Offshore Engineering and Technology at the Blue Economy CRC. So I will introduce the first two speakers and Naji will introduce the next two speakers for this webinar. Now, because of a, of a very tight time constraint, so uh, the, the uh, resume, the brief resumes of our various speakers are found in your, in your uh, uh, webinars announcement. So without further ado, I will now invite Mr. Rune Green, who is the Principal Engineer Control System Advisory of DNV Norway, to deliver his talk on Digital Twin, a tool for complex system verification. So Rune, please take the microphone. You can share your screen, yeah. I think you're on mute, Rune. You can see my screen now? Yes. And hear me. Okay, good. Very Excellent. good. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm, I'll be obviously be talking about Digital Twin and uh, our uh, approach on uh, using the Digital Twin for the testing of a complex system uh, on board vessels and rigs. But uh, before that, uh, I will also uh, talk a bit about the definition of the digital twin. There are many definitions, and I'm also going to say something about the different topics or the concepts of the digital twin, what it, it's used for and how it's it, it described. Before I will talk a bit about how we are using the digital twin technology uh, on uh, testing of uh, control systems and also how we can use the, the digital twin uh, in the life cycle of the vessels. And at the end, I just show some references to the DNV standards, uh, recommended practices, and uh, and class rules. So, 
So the digital twin, actually, the first time it was mentioned, it was by David Gelletner uh, in back in 1991. So it's yeah, 40 years ago almost. And a decade after that, it was first first introduced uh, by the University of Michigan. And then another decade went before it was actually practiced, used in practice uh, by NASA in 2010. So it's been around for a while and the last 10 years, the, the digital twin has become a kind of a hype and uh, it's used for uh, several different uh, topics or, or tools. So it's, I think it's wise to, to just to understand what kind of topics we are talking about. So the definition of the digital twin, we could say it's a digital twin is a virtual representation that serves as a real-time digital counterpart for a physical object or process. That's one way. There are many different kinds of uh, definitions, but this is one, one of the definitions. And today the digital twin is used in many contexts and become, uh, as I said, a hype term. We sometimes see digital twin described specification. However, it is often needed to clarify which it's referred to. So this is my overview of, over some of the definitions or uh, uh, types of digital twin that, uh, that we see in the market today. So we have the analytic model for structures and hydrodynamics that are imported as a design tool for verification of design and performance optimization. Then we have information models for systems and components that are important to show proper operation, maintenance, uh, safety assessment, and reporting to authorities. Then we have the 3D uh, visual, visual models, which is main, maybe the most known which is uh, applied for vessel design, operation planning, and training. Tra training simulators is, uh, I think, well known for, for this purpose. And together with analytic models and sensor data, this can provide efficient tool for the industry for inspections, maintenance, and repairs and such. Then we have time domain models uh, of components and systems provide uh, basis for process optimization. Control system testing, which is uh, our uh, main uh, business, operational planning and training. I just want to to emphasize that when I say uh, our our business, I'm working in maritime advisory for uh, control system uh, advisory. So it's uh, it's not DNV class on the whole company. I'm talking about when I say we. <laughs> Uh, then we have sensor and process data for real uh, real vessel use and performance monitoring, condition-based maintenance, this system support. It's it's on the start, uh, it's kind of, kind of basic now, but it's growing. So big data is growing and we will see more of this to come. And then at the end, we have software-driven control algorithms and visualized communication networks that are used for testing and verification software updates and virtual operations. So these are some of the definitions or some of the uh, digital twins that, that we see in the market today and that we see in our business. So looking at two of them, I'll, I'll give you some examples. Uh, th this example is from one of uh, our sections in uh, maritime advisory dealing with structures. It's called nerves of steel and uh, you, some of you might have heard about it. Uh, the NVS has developed a method for reusing models in operation to monitor structural performance. These models are quite expensive. So reusing of these models as a digital twin during the operational uh, life cycle of the vessel gives a lot of value for optimization and maintenance and inspections. So nerve, nerve of steels, uh, nerves of steel, sorry, combines position, waves, sensor data, to simulate the loads on the asset during its actual operation. So you see, during uh, the analysis and the build and design of vessels or structures, there is a design value of how long a structure can, uh, the, the life of a structure and how it will fatigue during the, the operational time. But in reality, the actual load, uh, 
differs from the design value. Some, like uh, vessel B here, is uh, has more fatty uh, fatty damage than vessel A, which has almost none compared to the design value. So by com combining the digital twin, the, the model used for the design, together with data that we can collect from, for example, here the weather or other conditions in the in the area, we can actually predict the real fatish damage uh, through the digital twin and use that for reporting or uh, uh, on a normal report on the web page to adjust inspections and uh, when we need to actually do the uh, uh, do the maintenance, so it helps the industry to actually more uh, make the correct time for their inspections. And then, secondly, I'm going to talk more about uh, time domain uh, simulations, which is uh, which is more of the service that we provide in uh, maritime advisory uh, as my department. So we have since 2003, we have built models and we have built uh, simulators to test performance and, uh, and control systems for, for the offshore industry. So first of all, we are doing uh, dynamic capability simulations. The, the normal way to do it was to do static uh, analysis, but today we can do dynamic analysis. So you see here a model of a semi-sub that's uh, uh, in the environment of at this point very high waves. So we can actually show or, or, or calculate here if the vessel is within the expected uh, position. So the green is uh, acceptable. The red will then give an alarm to the operator that uh, that you're outside of the position and you might need to stop your operation. And this uh, capability analysis, they are also uh, subject to a new standard uh, that the DMV has uh, uh, published. I'll get a bit more back to that. The 3D model is just for, for for showing how it's working. Normally we don't make 3D models for every capability simulation we do. And then for cyber physical systems, we, we have a, a change the term of control system to cyber physical system uh, because it's uh, both software and physical components within uh, the control system loop. So we need to take care uh, or um, uh, yeah, all of them. Oh, I'm sorry about that. So software is introducing uh, new risks uh, when when uh, when it's introduced in the control system, and uh, the software is more and more present on board vessels, uh, and the updates of the software is also quite crucial now. So normally, when uh, when a vessel is updated. Uh, with a new valve or new pipe, it's uh, quite substantial of inspections and testing and verification that this is actually working. But for software, it's tending to do an uh, upload and then the vessel is good to go. But we see that uploading new software, uh, there are uh, uh, subject to unpredictable failures. That's not possible to, to see. So software does not fail in a uh, predictable way. Software errors can also, are also called systematic faults and methods for the de determination and quantity of software failure probability and software re re reliability are controversial. We don't put mean time between failure, for example, on the software component. And then several components are combined into a system, a system or system of systems, new emergent properties occur. Due to interconnections and interactions, these new properties cannot be determined by the prior analysis. However, they can be de determined by using simulations or observing the systems. And then, of course, connectivity and networks are uh, important these days, and mainly uh, focusing on uh, on cybersecurity and uh, vulnerability for cyber attacks. 
so complex complexity challenges as we see them. So software and system integration is uh, known, uh, uh, not a problem, but it's no challenge. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, complex uh, operations, I mean, we, we make complex uh, control system with complex uh, interfaces, complex human machine interfaces. So it's uh, not only always uh, easy for operator also to use the systems. We need to uh, focus on the change management. What do we do when we change the software? How do we test it? Do we pre-test it before we launch it on the vessel or on the rig? And then we have the cybersecurity threats. We can use this for design and optimization. I mean, if we could predict uh, the size and of thrusters, generators, and such before we start laying the key, we will save uh, lots of challenges and money. And of course, system safety is, uh, is quite important. So looking at the control systems today, I guess many of you know how this works. Uh, however, just uh, to show, uh, we have the control system uh, on the left side, which contains hardware and the software. And then we have the IO modules that sends the control to, uh, signals and uh, receives the measures, the feedbacks from the, from the systems. Then we have the system with the actuators and the sensors, and also, of course, the dynamics, which is the hull, the environment, like waves, wind, and current, and such, uh, in the controlled uh, environment here on the, on the right side. So first, in 2003, we started with heel testing. So we simulate all these externals, the actuators, the sensor, the dynamics, and the environment. We connect that to the real hardware, on the left side. So obviously we would need to be in a lab or we need to get a hold of the controller that contains the correct software and, and firmware. And then we run the, the system uh, as it uh, believes it's still uh, running as uh, on board the vessel as uh, a normal operation. I see my time is flying. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, the hardware uh, is not always uh, easy to get, and it's uh, it's also one of the components that makes heel testing quite expensive. So, so taking this to the next level, we are uh, now also uh, have the possibility to upload the, the control system as an emulator into the uh, cloud, for example, and then run everything in the in the, in the cloud. So. The only thing that's left of the real uh, assets from the vessel is the software, which is the target. We put this in the cloud, and then we have a loop uh, for, for testing of the control system in the cloud. We call this setup a digital component. So this digital component can be a represent, for example, a power management system, a trust control system, crane or drilling component or whatever you would like to test. And of course, I said that integration is one of the most uh, yeah, known uh, challenges uh, when, when um, building a vessel. We can also put these uh, components together. So I'll just go to the next one. Just So what we do here, we use a common uh, co-simulator with the Sunrise uh, interface. We use FMU uh, function uh, interface. Then we connect all the different uh, components or the, the, uh, this, the models and the control systems to the same interface. Then we, of course, we need to monitor this. We can also uh, make hybrid solutions because there are quite many, many um, vendors that doesn't have uh, the possibility to emulate their, their hardware. So you can have a hybrid and you can also do remote interfacing. You can also do this uh, decentralized uh, testing if, for example, a vendor doesn't want uh, this to be uploaded to the, to the environment. And then out of this, you can also use uh, 3D modeling testing, test tools, scenario management, automated testing and such. So for one client, we built one component into one of their systems so they ac actually can do testing on board the vessel themselves.
Yeah, and sensor data, of course, can be in included here. To make this more available for, uh, for the industry and for more stakeholders, we have a project or a go ongoing in the, our research department. Uh, it has been also run as a JIP, a joint industry uh, project to make an open simulator uh, platform. Oops, I'm sorry about this. It's, um... Yeah, so the overall vision is to efficiently establish simulation models that can assure optimal performance of complex systems. And to justify and make most of the system, simulation models and system vessel model, it should be available, accessible to a range of users. The main idea is to allow different parties, like OEMs, vendors, owners, to connect to the virtual integrated system in the cloud much earlier than the uh, commission at the yard. And remain connected through an update system simulation model throughout the life cycle of the vessel. So when when a software update is performed, it can be tested on in the virtual uh, uh, digital bin before launch on the vessel. Am I on time or? Uh... So uh, to yeah, do this, go ahead. yeah, to do this, we also established a simulation trust center. So the trust center uh, purpose is to give the users uh, the possibility to upload their FM user models into a, a safe environment. The vendors themselves or the provider themselves can uh, decide whether the model is open or if it's uh, locked. Secondly, the Simulation center will assess or will give the possibility to configure uh, code simulations, how to connect. And there are tools in the center that helps configure the model so they are uh, able to connect them together. And uh, finally, the full system is simulated and the results will be available for download. So when you run the simulations, there's also a generator for uh, download reports from the from the simulator trust center. Of course, tools for testing is not included in the trust center. So if we would like to use this setup for for heel testing or seal testing, uh, then uh, then tools needs to be provided by the user or by command asking us in the maritime advisory, which can provide that. So the benefits, the benefits of the digital twin is uh, quite substantial. Uh, one thing that we find very important is that when a digital twin or a model of the vessel is uh, established, it's very important to use the model uh, of the life cycle of the vessel. Because prior it was only used in new build because there were demands from the, from the old companies. But uh, since it's quite, uh, it takes some time to build them and so the, the, the cost is a bit high sometimes. It's uh, important to use it in the design phase for optimization in the construction for testing and verification of software, and also maybe uh, used for commissioning, pre-commissioning in, in a safe environment, and in operation for, for testing uh, of the software upgrades and also verification of, uh, of software updates, and additionally also for, you, for uh, training of the group. We have some good uh, references for people using simulators on the vessel, introducing failure mode. So it's quite efficient for that to see what actually happened when the system fails. Mm. So finally, uh, the rules and standard that we are using in DME today, we have the normal uh, ship rules, which now have some uh, additional chapters regarding smart weapons and data driven classification. They consist of uh, class guidelines for smart vessels, including ESV, which is uh, enhanced system verification, includes heel and seal testing, data driven uh, verification, which also includes remote testing uh, for also for inspections, 
uh, they, uh, the standards, the uh, standard for the dynamic uh, capability that I showed you in the video. And we have some recommend recommended practices for digital twin assurance and models. It's very important that the models are correct, of course. So there's a, a recommended practice for that. And we are also working on further recommended practices for, for example, AI and such uh, going into the future. And of course, automated uh, autonomous system is also very uh, important these days and is growing fast. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Rude, for a very informative talk on this very exciting digital twin technology and, and giving us a good, a little bit of history lessons and what has been done. And, and I wasn't quite surprised to see that DNB has his own the, uh, uh, rules uh, on, on digital twin and so on. So very, very nice. Thank you so much for sharing your, your deep knowledge on digital twin. Uh, so I can I ask you to stop sharing your screen so that uh, we can have our next uh, speaker. Uh, so I now invite Professor Zhu Dongqian from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering of the National University of Singapore to present his talk on sizing of fatigue cracks in welded plate connections from a sensor interface local digital twin approach. Zhu Dong, um, please take the microphone. Thank you, Professor Wen, for the introduction. And uh, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's a great pleasure to uh, present some of our recent work on the digital twins for uh, used to size the fatigue cracks and water play connections through the sensor interface approach. Right? So I, my name is Xu Dong Chen and uh, from the Center for Offshore Research and Engineering from NUS. Right? So uh, thanks to Mr. Lung again for the very nice introduction on the digital thing. So I can go a little bit deeper into the uh, more details about uh, the local digital twins. So this is uh, topics I'm gonna to talk about. Right? The first of all, I'm gonna talk about the sensor interface digital twin and how do we select the sensor data and uh, how do we go from the sensor data into the crack sizing by treating the crack sizing as a classification problem. And uh, we'll also talk about how do we actually update our learning model as the sensor data evolves through the fatigue life uh, of a welded connection. So what is a sensor interface digital twin? If we put ourselves uh, uh, in, a, in a situation by looking at welded connection, right? Uh, first, first of all, as mentioned by the first speaker, the digital twin is a digital replica. And we would like to uh, implement or plant some of the predictability uh, capabilities in the digital twin by uh, allowing it to predict the physical behavior of the physical asset. In this case, it's a welded connection under cyclic loading. So we will integ in integrate some of the uh, learning algorithm, neural networks approach to estimate the crack size. And of course, to ensure that the digital twin is able to provide a, a close estimation or accurate prediction of the real crack behavior of a welded connection, we would like to interface the digital twin and the physical asset through some sensor data. So the next question is really what, okay, that's the purpose of a local digital twin. We, as I've mentioned, we would like the digital twin to be able to predict the defect sizes of fatigue cracks, and it should be able to get updated by, uh, by, uh, by, by some self-updating algorithm from based on the updated sensor data, right? And uh, we should also allow the sizing of the crack sizes to be in integrated with the integration or inspection or, or, or strategy of a real asset so that the life cycle cost of the uh, of the structure can be can be optimized to some extent right so the, ne the next question really is how do we select the sensor data right what kind of sensor data should we select of course the pur our purpose is really to look into the uh, accuracy or predictability of the digital twin in the crack sizes so the, set, the first condition for the size the sensor data is that it should be able to reflect the crack size. Right? So if that is the case, the, the first thing that comes into our mind is probably some of the NDT data. Right? For example, the ultrasonic phase array data, uh, eddy current data, will this be applicable? But if we further think about it, uh, those data should be quite easy to measure. Right? And uh, whether it's whether the structure is underwater, whether the structure is above water, we should be able to uh, measure it with the 
with a very convenient approach. And uh, also it should be, uh, should the sensors are preferably to be there for long-term for monitoring purposes. Right? So some of the NDT are, are on and off. Right? Once you have an inspection, then you, you, you engage the NDT and you collect NDT data. Once the inspection uh, is, uh, is completed, you will need to take away the NDT uh, equipment and will probably come back uh, in a few years time to, to collect the data the data again, right? So the frequency of the data may not be sufficient for monitoring purpose. So uh, I, I work a lot on fracture mechanics, so or especially the experimental fracture mechanics. So one of the, one of the uh, parameters that we use in the fracture mechanics test to determine crack size is really the displacement or what we call a compliance, the, the displacement versus the load. Right? So in other words, from the ratio of the displacement, you can see from these two figures, as the crack size increases, right, uh, the, the opening displacement measured at crack mouth is going to increase as well. So if we divide it by the same uh, the load ratio, right, so we will get a larger compliance for the, for the larger crack size. So the, the, the displacement, in a way, is able to reflect the crack size and we can we can use uh, numerical tools to have a deterministic uh, relationship between the compliance of the uh, structure and the crack size right, through this equation so we know that displacement is is uh, is an uh, important parameter so related to that uh, probably the derivative of displacement, which is strain. Strain is a reflection of the displacement. Right? So the question is, strain gauges are commonly available, so, or, or, or strain type sensors are commonly available. So the question is, can we use strain data to reflect the crack size? Right? So we move uh, one step further to do some simple experiment. It's a, it's a welded connection, cruciform type of connection, and we load the specimen under tension, and there are different thicknesses of the specimen. And uh, we compare the numerically predicted uh, so-called uh, strain concentration together with the discrete experimental measurement for cases without a crack, which is shown by the black color and black curve. Uh, and as compared to a, a case where we see a smooth thickness crack, which has been developed under the fatigue loading, we do see that the strength concentration has uh, degraded by quite a substantial amount. So there's obvious evidence of strain relaxation. Right? So the question is, how do we determine or how do we estimate from a strain sensor or strain relaxation to determine the crack size? Right? So we use the, uh, we try to, look into more cases. Right? The first case is the through, thick, through width crack, the same type of connection in numerical models. And obviously there is a very obvious, uh, very apparent uh, strain relaxation as the crack size increases from zero, which is corresponding to the intact joint to, uh, to a crack size of up to 18 millimeter, which is close to half of the plate thickness. And we look at uh, semi-elliptical cracks and even in the cases of multiple cracks, the strain re relaxation is quite obvious. In other words, we can more or less get a one-to-one -one relationship between the strain relaxation and the crack size. Right? So, so so what is the relationship between the strain relaxation and crack sizing? So we want to, in, we want to get that relationship through uh, a, a machine learning approach or neural net, network approach, because at the moment, I think a deterministic physical model still uh, does not exist yet. So we treat the crack sizing as a classification problem. For example, this is the crack size, the crack area and enveloped by the red curve. Right. So in a numerical model, we have, of course, finite element models, right? So uh, those nodes which correspond to the uh, crack, opening crack is denoted as opening no, open nodes, and those nodes which are corresponding to the intact material, they are denoted as the closed nodes, right? So uh, if, and of course, we classify the open nodes and give it a value of one. So if at a, as a, at a particular location, we have two open nodes, the corresponding classification will be one plus one is two. That means that two elements that's been, that has been opened and the corresponding crack depth will be two multiplied by the element depth. Right? So in order to have, uh, that brings a question that in order to have accurate crack sizing, we need to have sufficient number of elements across the thickness. So in this case, we have 50 elements across the thickness for, for a thickness of 40 millimeter that corresponds to a 
cracking, crack sizing precision of 0 0.8 millimeter, or, or if, you have, if you have a 20 millimeter uh, thickness, that will correspond to a crack sizing resolution of 0 0.4 millimeter. And we start to train this relationship between the strain relaxation. So the, the, we, 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 are, we have divided the input data into 21 neurons. Each neuron represents the strain relaxation uh, across the width of the uh, specimen. So we have divided the entire specimen into 21 columns. So each, each neuron is corresponding to the strain relaxation of uh, one particular location along the width of the specimen. So uh, we have one layer of training. And of course, we have tried multiple layers as well. And the one layer is uh, 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 delivers uh, efficient as well as sufficiently accurate uh, uh, computational results. And the output layer, we have 15 neurons, each representing the classification of each layer. And from the 15 neurons, we can calculate the number of uh, elements that has opened in each, uh, in each location, corresponding to each width of the uh, specimen. So we have uh, in the training data, we have uh, more than 140 sets of training data. And uh, in the validation data, of course, we have about 40 sets of validation data. So this uh, training data includes various uh, configurations, crack configurations, include, which includes a full width crack, sem one semi-circular uh, crack, two semi-elliptical cracks, and three uh, semi elliptical cracks which are overlapping with each other. So these are the training data which represents the accuracy of the crack sizing. So this error band, the zero, for example, zero to 0 0.4 represents the accuracy of a crack sizing. So for most of the uh, training data, we are able to, uh, for about 71% of the training data, we are able to achieve a crack sizing accuracy of 0 0.4 millimeter. Right? So if you, if you, if you look at uh, crack sizing accuracy of less than 1.2 millimeter, uh, it occupies more than 90, about 94% of the entire training data. For the validation data, for accuracy less, uh, for accuracy low, uh, uh, with the error lower than 1.2 millimeter, that uh, leads to about 88%. Uh, so yeah, so the, when we talk about uh, the uh, real crack sizing in, 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 the, in, in the real connections, I think some of the, uh, we need to deal with the, some of the challenges. The first challenge is the uh, evolving uh, strain data. The strain data may not be as, uh, uh, there may be some noise over as the, uh, during the data collection and there, there might be some uh, uh, changes in the strain relaxation as the crack propagates. And of course, there will be uncertainties in the field data. And one of the, one of the uh, biggest challenges is uh, probably the scarcity of that strain data. Right? In the numerical model, we can always have the luxury to have as many strain data as, as possible. But in the field or even in the experimental data, we, we cannot possibly have 21 strain gauges pasted along the width of the specimen. And uh, we can have but we, uh, in, the, in the specimen that we have tested, we only managed to get uh, nine string gauge data across the width of the specimen. Right? So, so uh, as the string gauge uh, data evolves, the, the neural network model, which is trained based on original strain relaxation model may not be accurate anymore as the crack uh, sizes increases. So we use some of the uh, NDT data to update our neural, neural network model. So we are, we are using two types of uh, NDT data. One is the alternating current uh, potential drop, right? So this is the ACPD probes, which is uh, fixed on the, on the welded connection near the crack uh, location. And the other one is the ultrasonic phase array, which delivers a quite accurate uh, crack sizing right, in a non-destructive manner. So as here you are, what we are seeing are the two comparison of the uh, neural, not, neural network model prediction. Uh, the yellow color indicates the model prediction in terms of crack sizing uh, without updating the neural network parameters. As you can see, as the number of cycles increases, the accuracy of the crack sizing is actually 
becomes uh, becomes quite uh, quite bad. Right? The error between the the largest crack size between measured crack size and uh, the predicted crack size is quite large. But if we are able to update the model using the crack uh, collected uh, crack sizing data, the accuracy of the uh, of the um, neural network model prediction is significantly improved, which is shown in the green color uh, plot. Right? So yeah, so this is another comparison in terms of the scarcity of the data. Right? We have nine stream points, so we can play around with the nine stream data points. We can use uh, seven of the stream data points uh, among the nine data points, or we can even select five stream or sometimes three streams data points for the model updating purpose. So what we are seeing here uh, is the plot, again, comparison with the neural network model without model updating. Uh, the green color shows the data comparison with neural, uh, with, with uh, uh, model updating. So, uh, so if you look at the left data, the vertical axis is indicating, again, the, uh, the error in terms of the measured crack size and predicted crack size, the maximum difference. And so as we move, as 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 the crack propagates uh, further, right, the error will will continue to increase with a maximum error of ten millimeter. However, if we if we uh, keep our model updated, neural network model uh, parameter updated against the measured crack size, we can. Uh, maintain a reasonably accurate uh, model in terms of crack sizing. And of course, if you look at the, the, the in terms of the string data scarcity, uh, the left figure shows the that, uh, of course, if you only have five string data, the accuracy is still uh, slightly compromised. Uh, the, the, the seven data points and nine data points, they are overlapping with each other. And uh, on the right, of course, if we look at the the model updating based on the five string data points, uh, they are not too bad actually we, uh, with the maximum error around uh, four millimeter in terms of crack sizing. Right. So uh, that brings to the summary of my talk. I think uh, very quickly I've gone through some of the local digital twin concept, which is based on the string data as an interface between the physical model and uh, the local digital twin model. And uh, the neural network is able to predict quite uh, reasonably accurate the crack size as compared to the test measurement. Right? And of course, if we're able to update the neural network model, we will, we will, it will allow us to enhance the accuracy of the crack sizing uh, quite significantly. So moving forward, I think there are still a number of uh, challenging problems that we would need to solve, right? For example, uh, string data, string gauge, or whatever string sensor that we have is only able to give us uh, the string data at discrete locations, right? So if we are able to engage, for example, image processing approach, we will be able to get a full field of string data at near the critical locations instead of discrete points. That will help us to enhance the accuracy of a crack sizing quite significantly. And of course, uh, the, the, the approach that I show you is for just one local digital twin and uh, for real application, we would expect that a network of local digital twins will be uh, help us or help the owners to identify the critical locations which require attention, which require immediate repair. And in terms of the machine learning model, right, we, I think we would like to have uh, some, we would need to do some fundamental research in terms of the physics-based fatigue assessment uh, framework. For example, uh, currently we are using the neural network uh, model because the physical relationship is not very clear. If we, if we are able to understand more details about, about the physical behavior and we are able to come out with a, a a physical based statistical model, we probably can do away with the neural network and machine learning. And we can use a more updated uh, statistical model, which is physics driven to for the fatigue life estimation and for fatigue crack sizing estimation. Right? So the last thing we want to do is, uh, is probably to integrate the crack sizing estimation with the maintenance strategy and repair technology. For example, additive manufacturing for, for offshore structures. Uh, for various kind of applications. Mm -hmm. So with that, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. And that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Sudong, for a very enthusiastic uh, 
sharing of your uh, research on sizing of cracks uh, using a digital twin approach. So that is something for us to think about that we could use this digital twin to do such a thing. Um, so uh, if for the audience who are following the, uh, the, the talks, uh, please uh, post your questions through the Q&A tab, uh, which we will, the, sp the speakers will try to answer it towards the end of all the four presentations. So now uh, I'd like to pass the microphone to my co-facilitator, Dr. Najib Abdusami, uh, to, uh, to, to introduce the next two speakers. Najib, please take the phone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Simong. Uh, it gives me pleasure, the, the pleasure to introduce our third speaker for today, which is Dr. Michael Abondo. So if Michael, if you can share your slide, please. Hi, good afternoon. Just checking if you can see my slides. Yes, please. Yeah, we, we see. Yeah. Just, yeah. So the, Dr. Michael is the CEO of the Ocean Pixel Singapore and ha has lots of experience, more than 15 years of experience on several various, I mean, areas, including research and development and, and uh, demonstration ecosystems, as well as digital transformation, autonomous vehicles, just to name a few, in a close collaboration with academia, industry, and government. Uh, his presentation, it is, as you can see on the screen here, on digital ecosystem is approach for blue economy development. So without any further delay, so it's over to you, Dr. Michael, please. Thank you, Dr. Nagy. Yeah, uh, yeah well, this afternoon, I wanted to share a little bit on uh, how we um, have been incorporating digital tools, um, including digital twins, um, into a digital ecosystems approach. Um, towards blue economy uh, development, um, mostly for uh, projects, uh, but also uh, for certain frameworks as well. So um, Ocean Pixel, uh, we are a spin-off of uh, the Energy Research Institute at Nanyang Technological University in 2014. We started off supporting the marine renewable energy sector um, because we figured that that's where a lot of this um, uh, acceleration in the uh, let's say project transitions or energy transitions would be needed. Um, and we have helped the uh, uh, project development process with the use of some tools, um, primarily um, geographic information systems based suitability analytics. And, you know, before uh, a lot of the savvy terms, should we say that um, people use now in the industry have uh, um, become popular. Um, we have been working behind the scenes to um, use a lot of uh, the uh, analytics and, and geographic information systems based uh, approaches um, for site device matching, looking at uh, project developers um, in renewable energy, the technology developers, um, financiers, even the engineering procurement construction companies, as well as those um, that would uh, be needed as stakeholders, for instance, government agencies, regulators, um, uh, even the uh, um, off takers um, and, and other consultants within the space. So <clears throat> we work primarily in the Southeast Asian region. And now that we are a participant in the Blue Economy CRC, we have uh, tried to also see how we can apply some of the learnings we have um, and also see what we can learn um, from the BECRC um, uh, collaborations as well. So we all know that uh, a, for the sustainable development goals to be uh, achieved, uh, actually a data revolution um, is needed as well. Um, and beyond that, if, if you follow the, the logic there, beyond just data, um, you will also need um, a way to understand these data and uh, a way to action um, the insights that you have from the data. So <clears throat> the, the blue economy, um, as we all know, uh, really uh, has a number of sectors. And uh, you know we highlighted um, food, uh, sort of aquaculture and, and energy um, as part of the blue economy CRC. But beyond that, there's also, of course, uh, sustainable tourism, um, there's transportation, you know, with the use of uh, electric boats and 
there's a whole uh, set of services which uh, perhaps um, in more developed countries um, are, are not maybe the focus, but uh, in developing countries like the Philippines, Indonesia, when you look at island ecosystems and island clusters, you then think about sustainable development when you, you look at islands uh, to be very holistic and integrated. So energy will be needed for water production, for instance, and, uh, you know, and can in improve operational efficiencies in, in uh, and day-to-day day-to-day uh, engagements even. So to a certain extent, the sustainable integrated development for islands and coasts um, paved the way for us to look into uh, holistic project development where you know, people don't just look at energy, but um, look at energy maybe for the sake of other ecosystem services such as transportation, aquaculture, fisheries, um, ice making, water production, you know, even uh, simple things that uh, would be needed on, on these islands. And uh, we have worked with um, uh, the Asian Development Bank to look at um, small island developing states uh, like the Maldives, Palau, the Marshall Islands um, to, to top it off. Now, this digital ecosystem um, or digital ecosystems, as we put it, towards blue economy project development is underpinned really by the not just complexity of, of uh, and, and number of, uh, of elements uh, being considered when it comes to project development, but also because uh, a lot of the um, planning or scenario building and, and maybe even uh, certain questions are now being tackled um, with the use of uh, either models, simulations, or to a certain extent, some, some form of uh, intelligence um, uh, based uh, uh, analysis um, that would take into account whether expert um, opinion uh, coupled with, let's say, new ways of uh, representing um, data events or, or um, expected events even, right? So um, if we tie all of that together, um, there is no way for us to, to really uh, achieve um, uh, good uh, project development without the use of digital um, uh, tools. And that's very true even for various sectors of blue economy. And today I, I would like to share some of these tools that might build an ecosystem for um, blue economy projects. Um, the potential pilot projects that uh, we look at when we integrate um, different sectors uh, may include small scale, you know, marine renewable energy, whether it's solar, tidal, offshore wind, uh, etc. But it has to have some sense of um, um, a project uh, with uh, end use applications and not just, let's say, electricity, for instance, uh, transportation, as we mentioned, you know, electric vessels, ice making for, let's say, fishermen who need ice, um, monitoring of the environment, desalination of water, you know, you could test bed a lot of things. And, and I think um, in, in the region in Southeast Asia, um, microgrids has been uh, quite a, a, a topic area um, that uh, a lot of R&D has gone into. And, you know, we can impregnate that with uh, a number of these uh, new technologies. And with that comes, you know, a number of uh, questions that could be actually answered using digital twins. So some digital tools that are quite easy um, off the top of our heads, we may already refer to uh, are the likes of, you know, data management, analytics, visualization, dashboarding. And, and recently, I, I think there was a webinar where we um, participated in a project uh, that involved the uh, risk registry. So just looking at an interactive dash dashboard that looked at uh, different hazards across different domains in Australia's uh, well blue economy, and you know we were able to um, uh, get uh, expert opinion and some workshops, you know, looking at the cross-linking of domains and hazards, um, just to be able to see which uh, areas, which sectors. Um, may need a little more attention. And coupled with that, obviously, you have um, some, some form of a, a interactive dashboard where, where people can, can make sense of the data um, and you know, can deep dive into certain uh, metrics that they would want to do. So that, that's an example of something very simple. And 
you know, if we go one tier uh, higher, I, I suppose um, you can look at tools like geographic information systems, and and we use these tools um, day in day out for for citing um, of projects, for instance, but not just that. Um, also for selection of technologies that may be suitable for that site. So shown in this slide is a way to maybe look at sites uh, for tidal in stream energy in the Philippines and you know a database of devices that users can upload and could maybe quote unquote um, test the performance in the water if it were placed in in certain locations as compared to other devices and you'd end up with some form of suitability uh, analysis here where you can have maybe a device that generates more because it's sized properly or a device that doesn't um, uh, Really, uh, cut in because uh, you know the cut in speed was designed to be at a certain uh, velocity range. Then you can also look at water depths and all that and do some screening. So your standard multi-criteria decision analysis um, can be uh, an offshoot of uh, tools like the geographic information systems. So this is very useful for for blue economy project development. And coupled with that, you can even look at uh, other um, scenarios. Right? For instance, this is. Uh, island uh, onshore wind um, analysis, but this can be extended to offshore, obviously, or floating platforms even, um, to look at you know um, uh, what kind of turbines can be deployed if I had, let's say, certain constraints on um, the, the noise decibel levels, you know, or um, certain constraints on, on shadow because there's a community nearby. So um, the, the use of, of these tools um, will help uh, project developers in assessing not just the sites, but also assessing um, the sizing of, let's say, uh, a power uh, a power plant or a wind turbine, um, wind array, you know, for these uh, locations. So we, we all know that um, digital tools can also uh, include uh, things like computer vision. This is an example of a, um, a technology uh, that, that we use um, in the Philippines to identify, to estimate the weight and the length um, or the size of uh, different fish underwater. Obviously, it's uh, well known that uh, I mean we are in the um, uh, center of like the biodiversity, uh, the coral triangle. Um, so in the Philippines, it's uh, it's quite important to look at um, that projects are um, uh, aware of environmentally sensitive areas, and at the same time, you know. Um, to be able to do some environmental monitoring, baselining, and during operations of, of certain offshore um, projects. Um, so it's important to, to note this. Um, previously, this was done very manually by divers, and now it's automated. You know? So the use of uh, computer vision and techniques that automate um, certain types of uh, analysis, like counting and estimation and you know, um, vision-based uh, uh, vision-based identification can actually uh, make use of, uh, of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning um, methodologies, you know. Um, more digital tools um, underway that's currently, uh, you know, being used by industry include um, augmented reality, mixed reality, virtual reality. So in a nutshell, people call this uh, XR, extended reality. And uh, for one, we are, um, have been working with uh, NTU, who has used a lot of these uh, mixed reality um, technologies, um, combining you know two hololenses um, um, to basically do some collaborative um, uh, a decision making for let's say air, air traffic controllers. Now you might say, how, how is that related to blue economy, Mike? And the answer would be, well, you can look at it from let's say a uh, marine perspective, um, maybe to vessels or you know marine operations. It could even be uh, sh shipping or ports, right? And and you know there are uh, people out there who look at uh, digital uh, tools already for navigation and let's say marine operations and and having um, uh, extended reality uh, become uh, part of that. Uh, um, set of operations um, only enhances um, um, sort of the, the management and as well as maybe even the, uh, 
should we say the the, the throughput of, of these types of operations if if used properly um there are more applications beyond blue economy for these technologies obviously but um, we we tend to try and look at it for maybe some of the uh upgrading of let's say um transport sector of inter-island um, boats, vessels, which includes obviously fishing and, 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 and medicine, emergency response, as well as um, you know, day-to-day -to -day tourism. Um, so all of that can include uh, some of these tools. Now, um, beyond just the tools and, and looking at the tools as part of an ecosystem, uh, needs more than just um, the computers and and you know the, the intelligence behind it. Um, there needs to be some frameworks as well. Um, well, one example that that we cite is marine spatial planning, for instance. I mean, marine spatial planning is not just accomplished by tools alone. You need certain frameworks and certain commitments as well um, from policy and and regulate regulation as as well as you know certain strategic thrusts. And for sustainable development, uh, we know that there are sectors that need to come and agree and, and the marine spatial planning tool the op choice or let's say a digital tool which could um, amount to a marine spatial planning tool uh, can become an enabler for conversations to happen as well with various sectors in transportation or food or energy and and that's that's good we think that you know um, if people are aware about let's say renewable energy resources and in the slide you have you know on the left one offshore wind resources then the second one from the left is where certain tidal and and uh, wave energy resources are then people know maybe where the off grid and grid um, uh, main grid uh, connections are and you know certain information like for instance um, high electrification low electrification and poverty indexes um, this will all help to uh, maybe prioritize, um, let's say, where projects should uh, um, focus uh, on and where certain investments or budgets should be allocated and which regions should be prioritized. So that uh, comes into play uh, quite well. Another example would be if, let's say, for a specific project, you wanted to um, mix and match different digital tools. And this is something that we're doing with Hitachi at the moment, combining dashboarding with, let's say, um, machine learning, the computer vision, as well as you know, um, um, information and education uh, campaigns. Um, so even if you had a small scale pilot project, and we are working also with the AOEG folks to look at um, what might be a pilot project, a simple showroom type of approach on, on a blue economy that features ocean energy, then you know, you'd probably need some form of digital twin for the systems that are going in the water or that are being represented there so that people can you know adjust it according to their own site or their own specs they might want to do what if scenarios around it so having that interactive digital twin is important then you also need to have a lot of the tools that we've mentioned before whether it's you know as simple as a project website the educational content some form of uh, underwater monitoring, maybe augmented reality, and and the smartness, the smartness around uh, these systems um, is a is a big plus. So um, we've come to know that you know there's certain behavior among stakeholders now that tend to want um, new things to be incorporated uh, into projects, um, and that you know opens up their um, uh, uh, an increased. Uh, absorption um, um, uh, bias uh, to a certain extent you know so these types of uh, ecosystem digital ecosystems um, uh, help uh, projects to, to move forward and and we think that you know the more that these digital tools digital twins and digital ecosystems are matured and and, and are incorporated into into the project development process, the better it is for the project when it comes to acceptability, it comes to investment, etc. Now, as a last slide, um, we acknowledge that we probably have a lot of efforts, you know, um, that may stem from R and D or pilots, and there may be stakeholders, um, whether it's, it's SMEs or um, uh, agencies that are. Uh, aware and, and are waiting for for blue economy projects to happen sure and you know that seed stage of these various efforts um, need to be able to uh, come to a 
hub stage where you know all of these uh, all of these uh, initiatives um, can become a little more coordinated and aligned, and uh, where synergies become obvious. And and we think when that happens, um, uh, it becomes a springboard to let's say uh, more uh, uh, active uh, approach to uh, the development of blue economy. And a lot of these things, each of the steps and each of the projects, initiatives, um, et cetera, can be enabled by a lot uh, of the digital tools I've presented just now and the ecosystems that, that come along with these um, digital tools. So um, with that, I think uh, I would close my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. It has been a great uh, presentation and you actually you showed us lots of examples, uh, which demonstrates how quickly the digital twin evolving in the maritime industry. So thank you for that. Uh, last but not least, I would like to invite Dr. Soma Marojo, the our uh, fourth speaker for today. So if, if you can, Soma, please share your slide on the screen. Is that fine? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, thank you very much. So, so Dr. Soma is the head of uh, data services at the BMT Houston, and he has a PhD in, in naval architecture and ocean engineering, master degree in computer science, lots of experience in asset monitoring and hydrodynamic of offshore structures. And lastly, but not least, he created the BMT Deep, which is a great platform for data analysis as a cloud-based platform. So without any further ado, so it's over to you, Dr. Sama, please. Thank you, uh, Professor Abdusami, for your uh, kind introduction. Um, I'm the last presenter, so I would not waste much time. Uh, I'd like to share our experiences building performance digital twins uh, based on our years of experience um, putting together sensor packages, building marine monitoring systems for offshore structures, uh, and also, we've been managing huge amounts of uh, measurement data collected all over the world from these uh, monitoring systems. And we are trying to see how best we can use all the data that, that has been collected over the years, the historical data we have, as well as the new uh, data that is being collected and being presented in near real time uh, on our platform. So what I'll do is I'll go through uh, our approach to digital twin, and then um, and and with a, a real case study of how we are using our digital twin and its applications. So um, I think uh, Rune already gave a few definitions of digital twin. Uh, a digital twin is an up-to-date representation of an actual physical asset in operation. And um, a digital twin could mean uh, different things for different user groups. Uh, essentially, you can build a digital twin on a component or a system of components or a system of systems. From our perspective at BMT, we are looking at structural components of assets such as the hull, mooring lines, risers, and tendons. Uh, as a representation of a physical asset in operation, a digital twin reflects a current condition and more importantly includes relevant historical data as well as external uh, information about the asset. Virtual representation can take a form ranging from a mathematical algorithm, like it could be physics-based or you could use machine learning and or um, um, artificial intelligence. Um, so here, if you can consider uh, what I'm showing, showing you different uh, subsystems, each you could build a digital twin for each of these subsystems, or uh, which you can call as components, or uh, a system, or a system of systems. So again, uh, in the offshore projects, there are two distinct phases. Uh, one is the design, build, and delivery and the other is the operations and maintenance. Digital twins may be developed and used during the design phase of the asset to determine construction, behavior, performance, et cetera. 
the design criteria, including computation models, et cetera, are established during this design and fabrication phases. And I think it has valuable information in it. And this can be transferred during operations. Uh, after hand over a new set of business processes and use cases arise. For per performance digital twins, use cases involve uh, information and business process for reliability analysis, inspections, maintenance planning, operational enhancements and all. And we could use uh, some of the design basis that has been developed during the design uh, for operations. And it could be a continuous improvement loop where your digital pins are improving based on uh, improving your or calibrating your models. So um, a key aspect from uh, a project developer's perspective would be how would you go about building a digital pin or even think about a digital pin? I think uh, this has to happen very well uh, in advance of um, putting together uh, uh, the structure or even building uh, the structure. So in the design phase itself, thought should be given to uh, understand what are the things that, we, that needs to be measured uh, based on uh, what the digital twin should be. Uh, there should be external, there could be some external factors also uh, like regulations, regulatory requirements and all. And then uh, sensors, appropriate sensors have to be installed. Uh, um, and then the data that is coming from the sensors is the most important ingredient uh, in addition to all the simulations and models, the physics-based models that we could build. Uh, quality control, uh, quality assurance of this data is uh, very, very important. And then the governance security that go with any data uh, uh, has to be considered. Uh, and then um, we are dealing with massive amounts of data, especially for uh, digital twins. How do we process the data? How do we store the data? Those kinds of things have to be thought through. And then uh, applications, uh, depending on who the end user is, uh, what kind of user experience uh, would help them use this digital twin to improve uh, the, uh, whatever the use uh, goal is and objective is. So user interface, user experience is important. Ultimately, the digital twin has to give insights or some kind of an action uh, that would allow the operators to uh, perform the duties efficiently. So here is a typical workflow. Uh, so like I mentioned, careful planning is needed even before the project work begins. Uh, Subsea sensors as well as sensors such as motion packages uh, should be installed in, um, requires to be installed in shipyards when you have level key, even keel and all. Uh, also uh, equipment that goes underwater, uh, you, I think they're best installed in a shipyard. Um, um, so measurements uh, and pre-processed data in real time uh, is available to the operators. Once everything is installed, the measurements that are coming from these sensors will be available to the operators in real time. Uh, but that's, that data can all be sent to uh, onshore. And when it is being sent onshore, uh, manual as well as automatic quality controls can be performed so that there is uh, little to no lag in using the data. And once the data arrives uh, on shore, the data can be tagged and stored while also trying to build your digital twins and uh, having several applications run based on this data. Um, so it's important to have other tools in your uh, data ecosystem, such as uh, tools for performing ad hoc analysis or building uh, new models or iterating over your models. Uh, all those uh, kinds of features uh, are uh, necessary in, a, in an ecosystem where you are trying to build digital trends. I want to uh, dig a little bit into the 
quality aspect. Uh, your model would be as good as your uh, measurement data. Uh, to get good quality data, I think uh, in the design phase of itself, should consider some kind of a redundancy in the measurements that you're making. Say, for example, if you're measuring wind, probably it's a good idea to measure the bow and the stern. Uh, or if you're measuring waves using air gaps, you might want to have a uh, few, few air, few sensors mounted uh, on the hull. Uh, in addition to that, uh, it's important to get quality at various stages. Um, now for example, in our systems, when we are collecting the raw data from the sensors, we try to uh, get output from the sensor itself, uh, whether it is getting proper signal or not. Based on that, we do uh, quality checks uh, just from the sensor itself. That is That forms our basic quality control. On top of that, we put deterministic uh, uh, algorithms as well as algorithms based on machine learning to automatically do the quality control. But ultimately, an uh, analyst or somebody knowledgeable uh, enough about the particular physics that's happening has to review the data and uh, do the final quality check. So this kind of a workflow helps a lot. Uh, in addition to doing the quality check, it also gives as an idea of how well the sensors are working, how well the system is working. So there's several advantages of doing quality control uh, upfront. In addition, I think um, uh, one uh, big aspect of a digital twin is to have uh, some kind of a feedback uh, to the end users, depends if it's operational personnel or engineer engineering personnel, uh, it depends uh, on the use cases also. You could have several kinds of alerts and notifications. Uh, for example, a certain group of people are interested in the amount of data that is being generated. Is it of good quality or not? Um, operations personnel probably are interested in operational thresholds. Uh, in some cases, you might want to have some custom thresholds where you are looking at multiple variables and trying to come up with some kind of alert or notification. So system should be capable of um, providing these kinds of uh, alerts and notifications. So I'll jump into a case study of how we applied uh, our digital pen. Uh, this, we, uh, we work closely with BP. Uh, by the way, this particular use case uh, we presented a paper at OMAE this year in Hamburg, uh, BP, and we presented this paper. So, um, so for this particular case, we built this digital pen to maintain vessel integrity and ensure operations within the allowable design limits. At the core of this digital twin are two components. One is the integrated marine monitoring systems that I alluded to earlier and VMTD, a cloud-based platform that stores, manages, integrates, post-processes, and displays vast data sets uh, collected by the IMMS, as well as data coming in from other sources. Uh, so, uh, like I said before, the implementation of this digital twin started during the feed, uh, identifying the data that needs to be measured through the whole chain to how the data will be used during operations. The primary purpose of the uh, current online digital twin is to make a direct comparison between the behavior during operations and the original design basis. Okay. So here, uh, what I'll do is uh, I'll go through, uh, there are two aspects here. One is the envi environmental monitoring component of the digital twin, which is the forcing on the, uh, the structure. And then next I'll go through the structural part of the digital pen. That is the response to the forcing uh, from the environment. So on this particular facility, uh, there are several sensors to measure the wind, uh, sensors to measure the waves and currents. Uh, in addition to these measurements, we were also getting data from nearby facilities. Okay, so these are the various sensors uh, and sources from where uh, we were getting the actual measured data. Uh, we were also getting from weather buoys nearby. 
So once we have the sources for this metrician data, like I mentioned earlier, QA, we do the QAQC of the data. And then uh, we are working with a partner uh, who the metrician experts, and they are providing a composite metrician data. This along with the uh, design basis that was uh, collected long before, we have like 50 years of design basis data for the environment around that region. Uh, we built dashboards, various dashboards for waves, wind, and current. So here is an illustration of uh, some examples of Metrosian dashboard that we have. Uh, this particular plot shows the joint occurrence distribution of significant wave height and peak periods over uh, selected period uh, uh, of the um, selected period. It could be few days, few months, uh, an year, or for the life of the platform. Uh, you could get that kind of a feature here, and you could build this kinds of charts. What we also have here is the uh, I forms for different return periods, like 10 years, 100 years, uh, 10,000 years. Um, so this chart, um, before this digital twin, uh, we have to do it on a case by case basis. Maybe annually you'll go and look at all the data that has been collected. But using this digital twin, uh, we can go and generate this kind of uh, charts uh, as and when we get the data. This is another plot where uh, it shows the annual contributions from each year of measured data uh, uh, of wave histogram plot. And you can notice that we have plotted the design basis in dark gray color here, as in the measured data is in shades of blue. Uh, clearly here, uh, to our surprise, we found that the design basis was expecting uh, the waves coming in the west southwest direction. But in reality, from the measurements, we noticed that the uh, waves were coming mostly from the west northwest direction. So uh, it was useful for the designers and the engineers to understand how the vessel is behaving compared to what it was designed for. Sorry. And this, this plot is the is a fan plot corresponding to the probability of exceedance of significant wave heights. Uh, we can do the similar kind of plots for wind speeds and surface currents. Uh, Again, in the background of measured metrosian parameters, the exceedance probabilities from the design basis hindcast data uh, is available and presented for months, quarters, or annual periods. Uh, and this allows identification of severe measured parameters compared to the vessel design parameters. As an example, the exceedance probabilities of the measured significant wave heights are shown here. So you can clearly see the severe winter storm deviating from the design basis here from the measured data. Okay, like I mentioned, uh, these charts you can control and it, it gives uh, features for the engineers to go and compare the current conditions against the previous conditions or maybe seasonality, uh, the winter storm conditions this year versus what it was previous year or the years before. So these kinds of tools help uh, engineers a lot. So now I'll go into the structural response part. Again, uh, like wind sensor, environmental sensors, we have other sensors here, like the six DOF motion packages, three DOF at the bow, uh, several strain gauge packages, uh, long wave strain gauge packages, et cetera, to measure the hull stresses and strains. Uh, pressure sensors could detect slamming. So all these sensors are mounted uh, on this particular platform. Just like I described for the environment uh, data flow, we have this data going through quality control as well as some uh, other features that we are getting from the design basis that go into the BMT deep. And from there, uh, we can get uh, different kinds of charts. For example, uh, you could, get the hull loads, fatigue damage, transfer stability, uh, et cetera. For example, here, uh, 
we try to mask uh, the chart, but pretty much you are looking at the roll periods uh, and draft versus the roll periods. It gives you some kind of uh, idea about the transfer stability of, of the structure. Here is a plot of um, uh, the vessel's position uh, of the offset. So we have actual position with the dots and in the background you have historically what were the positions of this particular structure and you can cl click on any one dot and you can see what was the environment like for, uh, at that particular time as well as the vessels heading as well as bearing. Uh, these kinds of charts uh, help um, um, the operators to figure out if the vessel is deviating from its uh, uh, position that you would expect it to and it can raise alerts and notifications so they can stop production if it deviates uh, away from its expected position. Uh, last example I would like to give is from a fixed structure. Uh, fixed structures usually uh, historically they didn't have much instrumentation to look at the structural responses. But in this particular case, uh, we had some six degrees of freedom motion packages installed on the structure. And it so happened that a huge hurricane passed through the structure. And we noticed that the period, which was at a certain point after the hurricane, it took a huge shift. So this was very insightful for, the, uh, for our uh, clients as well as for us to understand what was happening to the structure. And then from then on, we have been monitoring the structure quite closely. We have come up with uh, various criteria uh, that would alert some kind of uh, uh, issue with the platform and maybe even alert the, use, alert the personnel on the platform to even evacuate. So, uh, so uh, there are several use cases where um, measured data along with uh, good design basis can help uh, the clients, the end users with their use cases. Uh, what we are also seeing is uh, uh, newer client, newer projects. Um, we won uh, a new big project recently in uh, Western Australia where the clients are looking at uh, monitoring or having uh, sensor suites that can help them with uh, these kinds of applications. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Soma. It's a very interesting presentation. In fact, it, the, the, the case study was great to, to see. And looking looking to, into your paper, I think you, you mentioned that it has been published in OMA this year, yeah. Thank you. I think uh, considering, uh, thank you to all speakers. Uh, I think Professor Sim Wang now is almost 6.30. We have yeah. received some questions. One of them, I think from Professor Irene, our research director at the Blue Economy CRC. Probably we can pose this question to the speakers. It is in fact uh, the how the information is, is being implemented for fixed offshore wind assets uh, can be used to fast track and improve the development of a floating offshore wind assets. So from the fixed uh, offshore platforms or, or for, for wind, wind uh, industry, how it can be used to facilitate the development of the floating offshore wind platforms. So, would like to start maybe, Mike, you, you, you mentioned. Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, no worries. Um, thanks for the question, uh, Irene. Um, so I think the, there is transfer learning um, that could be applied here. Um, and I think it's not just for uh, this one instance, which you've mentioned, um, you know, um, that the use of digital tools um, in the design, construction, and operations of fixed offshore wind assets, um, and then transferring it to, let's say, floating offshore wind. Now, 
that is one way of transferring um, the know-how um, already to let's say wind to wind from fixed to let's say floating you can you have a lot of learning also in terms of the site planning permitting and consenting that can be applied not only to wind but also other um, marine renewables um, you know so i would say that the uh, the information um, that's available out there um, if we review um, from uh, the the objectives the metadata to let's say the down to the detail of uh, um, uh, looking at um, methodologies uh, as well as um, uh, the types of uh, maybe anomalies, uh, things that have been learned in, in let's say an offshore industry such as fixed technology, you know, fixed wind of offshore wind assets. Um, I think a number of those insights um, can be used to either inform what to avoid, <laughs> what not to do, or what to do better um, in terms of uh, not just the floating wind, but even offshore structures, marine operations, environmental monitoring. And, and I, I would dare say that um, uh, when we talk about the marine and offshore environments in, in particular, um, any project that, that touches that space, um, you can learn a lot from it and apply it to uh, a sector that uses the same space, but maybe with uh, a specificity to what kind of information may be useful. And, and I say this from experience of, let's say, looking at um, floating uh, renewable energy systems, whether it's tidal or, or, or wave or solar, um, you can look at these floating systems, maybe housing, not just renewable energy components, but, you know, containerized aquaculture uh, solutions, for instance, or you can look at it from an offshore charging station perspective, then you have an electric boat ecosystem. So I guess my, my answer would be to pay attention to um, not just the data, but the insights learned uh, from, from uh, beyond just the technology, but in, in the project per se, and apply that um, selectively and I would say smartly <laughs> to what you want to answer. And, and so that's why, uh, uh, this uh, knowledge database, knowledge base of um, is information that you can transfer, and, and that requires a, a combination of, of, of science and, and art. Um, I hope I didn't confuse. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, fortunately, our time has run out. So, if I may, and oh, sorry. Uh, and if I may add, okay, uh, thirty seconds. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, Fixed structures, like I said, uh, not much instrumentation was done, at, at least to my knowledge, but uh, floating offshore vessels, uh, instrumentation has been done for years, decades. And, uh, so all that knowledge can be transferred to offshore wind or yeah. uh, to other applications. So I, I think it's just a matter of getting people to talk and figure out ways to do it. Okay, thank you. With that note, I think we have to end this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, so thank you everyone for attending this uh, webinar, especially to our four speakers who have enlightened us on the digital uh, twin technology as well as its applications. Note that the recording of this webinar will be made available to all of you in the coming days. Uh, please do check out the Blue Economy CRC events page for any upcoming uh, webinars. So with that note, uh, have a very good evening, afternoon or morning, depending on your geographical locations. And we'll see you in, in the next uh, webinar. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.